As always, also now we can sing. Uh, if you'd like to sing, please wear a mask. Um, for Kensington, there's a lady guild, ladies guild meeting uh, Tuesday, September 22nd, 130. But I know that, that they invite any women from this congregation as well will be invited to that as well. Um, and Kensington area food bank needs. Uh, we've been talking about this the last number of weeks. There's a whole list of things there, and I know that. Uh, Just to note that on October 4th, uh, we're going to have communion. It might look a little different than uh, what we regularly do, but we will be having communion here. Slingshot it to you. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, but we'll, we'll have something set up that uh, we can do communion. Keeping safe as well.
morning as we say our gathering prayer. Loving God, you meet us in so many places and in so many different ways. You're there when our need is deep and we long for you. You're there when we think we can manage on our own. You are near to us in kindness, regardless of our state or condition. You turn weeping into laughter, sorrow into joy, death into life. You speak words of challenge and words of comfort. In gratitude, we come before you this day to seek your word for us and to enjoy your gift of life in its fullness. We receive our praise and our prayers this day and all. God, you are the giver of all good gifts, yet we confess that our own generosity is limited. We share what we have, but not often reluctantly. We, we complain about our circumstances. We, we compare ourselves to others. We fear running short of things rather than trusting your attention to our needs. Forgive us for our worries and our misguided ways. Lord, give us generous hearts that trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power of the Friends, the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's generous love reaches out to embrace us. In Christ, we are forgiven. We're set free to begin again. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for understanding of the scriptures. Holy, healing God, your thoughts are not our thoughts. And your ways are not our ways. As we hear your word read and proclaimed, guide us by your spirit so that our thoughts and our ways are transformed by your grace. Through Christ, your living word. Amen. Our responsive reading comes from the Psalm 145. We're going to be reading responsibly verses 1 through to 8. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One, One generation shall log your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The more that your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will wear your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, We're reading chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And at about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. And when those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. And now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. 
But he replied to one of them, Friends, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. You spend any time as a teacher in your field to hear the same things over and over again from students. When is it lunchtime? Why do we have to do this? Can I be first? Can I work with so and so? What game are we playing in gym? And of course, can I go to the bathroom? But there's also the typical comments. I'm bored. I've already done this. Mrs. So-and-so told me I didn't have to. I can't find it. This is stupid. The list is endless, but seemingly the most heard statement I think by far is, it's not fair. <laughs> Obviously the statement isn't exclusive to the school setting. We've all heard it many times. It's not fair that she gets to do that and I don't. It's not fair that he gets to stay up later. It's not fair she can do that. I couldn't at her age. It's not fair they have one. I'd like to say only young children like to cry a vowel, but we all know that that isn't true. These same words echo through our own heads whenever we feel we've been wronged or ill-treated. And as we get older, we may not verbalize our frustrations and jealousies, but inside, we're thinking it. This is because we seem to be born with an instinctive sense of fairness, an idea of what's right, what's wrong. And this is positive because it helps, it serves as a, uh, sorry, because it serves as a basis of justice and equality. Our sense of fairness helps us to see problems and to see equitable solutions. For example, we might recognize the inequality that some live in luxury while others live on the street. How some go hungry while others throw out their excess. How some have power while others have no rights or freedoms. And when we recognize these discrepancies, our innate sense of fairness can serve as a catalyst for change and encouraging us to act. However, the negative side of our innate sense of fairness is that we often have trouble looking past ourselves. As much as we can identify what's fair and what isn't, we frequently look inward, focusing not on others, but instead ourselves. We look at things through our own lens, and we question if it's fair for us. Too often the question becomes, what's in it for us, or is this fair to me? It's this egocentric view of fairness that makes most, if not all of us, get our backs up when we read the scripture passage we just read from Matthew's Gospel. And I'll admit that this biblical teaching is hard to hear and to understand. When I do so, I try to keep an open mind, but when I read about the treatment of the laborers, especially those who worked all day, I keep coming back to how it just isn't fair. A landowner goes out in the early morning looking for day laborers to toil in his vineyard, and he finds some willing to work, and they agree to a daily wage. With the negotiations complete, the laborers head off to the vineyard. Then about mid-morning, as the landowner walks through the marketplace, he sees more laborers who are standing around there idle. So he tells them to go and work in his vineyard, and he'll pay them whatever is right. This deal sounds quite reasonable. They only missed two or three hours of labor, and they still had a long day of work ahead of them, so they could still earn a good wage. Therefore, no real issues to the story so far. Except as the day rolls on, the landowner repeats his hiring process. Around noon, and then again at mid-afternoon, he goes out and he finds more laborers who weren't able to find employment on that day. Both times he sends them to the work in his vineyard with the promise of the right pay. And by the time the three o'clock hires arrive at work, the day is getting on. Therefore, you'd think his hiring would be done. Yet with only an hour left in the workday, the landowner surprises us because about 5 o'clock he went out and he found others standing around and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one's hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. I'm sure there was 
lots of work to be done, but I struggle with the idea of the afternoon's hirings, especially this last group, which makes little sense at all. What amount of work could really get accomplished in just an hour? Was it really worth it? The humanitarian in me admires the landowner for his willingness to help out those laborers as much as possible, giving them something to do and in the process helping them out financially. Therefore, up to this point in the parable, I can appreciate the actions of the landowner, even if I don't fully understand them. But like many of Jesus' parables, that story just doesn't end it there. Jesus continues, When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. And when those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Wait, did we read that right? The laborers who worked for only an hour received the usual daily wage. That's crazy. Does this landowner have more money than rains? Has he been in the sun too long? What kind of businessman is he? Given this surprising act of generosity, I don't think any of us would blame the workers who had been there all day for thinking that they received more than they had agreed to. It only made sense. The individuals who worked for an hour got a day's worth to pay. So working hard all day in the heat and the sun must be worth what? Double, triple, maybe even quadruple what they'd agreed to originally? In their eyes, it was only fair that they'd get more for the longer hours of work that they had done. But when it came time for them to be paid, they too received the same daily wage as everyone else before them. That's not fair. And the workers in the story agree. Jesus tells us they grumbled and were upset with the landowner for how they were being treated. But who can really blame them? Fair is fair, and this most definitely wasn't. But the landowner disagreed with the workers, saying, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do as I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? Admittedly, the landowner isn't wrong. He made an agreement with the laborers regarding their pay. And when they went off to work in the morning, they were content with the arrangement and the wages that they perceive. So when we look at it this way, I don't think any of us could really argue that the workers were treated unfairly. But this isn't really the issue, is it? The issue is that they got the same amount of money for working much longer and doing the same job. The landowner's claim, or claims he's generous, and I think we have to agree. His generosity is shown in his willingness to give away a day's wage to those who worked so little. Yet this doesn't diminish the fact that it's totally unfair for those who worked all day long, even though they agreed to that day of wage. No wonder they felt taken advantage of. It's this perceived unfairness that makes this parable not sit well with many of us. The landowner's actions, although generous for many of the workers, goes beyond our sense of fairness and how things should be. Why do we feel this way? The short answer, because we look at the world based on merit. The value, what we think we or others deserve based on what we think we've done or what we've earned. We like to make everything about ourselves and what's fair to us or what we think is fair or reasonable. But in this parable, Jesus is describing the kingdom of God and God's idea of fair isn't the same as that. Our Creator doesn't view things in the same way. Our Lord's divine grace isn't based on the merit system, what we've done or haven't done. We don't receive this gift through merit or the quantity or the quality of work. Instead, God's grace acts as an equalizer. It gets rid of our presumed privilege and puts us all on the same level. It's a gift for all of us because no matter who we are, we're all equally deserving or probably more accurately, we're equally all undeserved of this grace. And this is a difficult concept for us to grasp because merit and our ideas of fairness contradict God's gracious gift. Thankfully, the Bible has other examples of God's amazing grace. Jonah wanted to punish the people, the evil people of Nineveh, for 
their behavior, yet God grants them leniency and mercy. In another of Jesus' parables, the older son got upset because his younger brother returned and his father welcomed him home and threw a party despite all his past mistakes and selfishness. These stories go against our sense of fairness, what the people deserved, yet God offers grace. As followers of Jesus, we're not immune to the struggle of understanding God's grace. In our own calling, we may question and wonder what it is for us to keep the rule, or what's in it for us to keep the rules and living as Christ calls us to. Especially when we understand that others can come late to the party and receive the same reward. Therefore, what's the incentive for us to live as God's children? Why should we be doing what's right? while others mess up, but still receive God's grace. When we think of it this way, we're no better than the workers who agreed to a daily wage and toiled all day long and then complain about what the others receive. Instead, Jesus tells us we're not to grumble about what we see as unfair treatment by God. Instead, we're called to recognize God's amazing grace as a gift. Otherwise, if we see our calling as a burden, then God's gift lost on us. Friends, I encourage you therefore to live as Christ calls you and enjoy and appreciate God's amazing gift. Because through God's grace, we receive life, even though we don't deserve it. How fair is that?
Lord, we pray for places where pain and violence and cruelty seem to have the upper hand. We pray for places of conflict and war in those places that they may find rest. May each of us know and share your gift of peace. God of joy, we give you thanks for moments of delight and occasions of celebration, for happy gatherings and gentle solitude, for pleasures given and received, for laughter and friendship and love. We remember those who do not share such joy, those who are lonely or bitter, hurt, or who even are difficult to love. May each of us know and share your gift of joy. In God of love, in Jesus Christ, your love was born in human form. His love stretches far and includes outsiders and those who were rejected by others. As his followers, we are so grateful to be a part of your circle. And we pray for our families, those close to us and those who are estranged. We pray for friends and acquaintances, strangers, and many of those who are different from ourselves. Lord, we even pray for our enemies. Help us to be inclusive and not to be judgmental as we draw our circles of affection wider, seeking to share your gift of love with all people. We pray for the circumstances in our world. We think about all those affected by the dangerous wildfires in the West and the United States. We pray for all those living in the wake of hurricanes like Sally, especially those in Florida and Alabama. We pray for our world, but also the places in Canada where there's an increasing rise of COVID cases. We lift up our politicians and health officials as they seek to lead us through this pandemic. Lord, we come to you with heavy hearts as we think of those two teenage boys who died out west. We pray for their family and friends and for the communities. We think of the residents who lost their homes in Stratford to the fire. And all those on our hearts and minds this morning as we come to you in silence.
peace to love 